Today, friends, Derek Henry, founder of Healing the Body and the Thrive Lifestyle Academy. And today I have with me Andrea Ebert, with, Ebert. who is a uh, better life advocate who likes to talk on a lot of different topics, politics, health, whatever it is, um, to uphold our rights as citizens and tell the truth. And that's what we're here to do today. Uh, we want to tell some truths, um, at least our truths, on how the quarantine is affecting us maybe negatively. What di- what day are we on now, Andrea, of the quarantine? Do you know what day we're on? What? I don't even know. I don't even know, honestly. It's a blur. Is it March 17th? Almost a month? Are we into the quarantine? Has it been almost a month? Do you know what? I don't even know. There was talk about going into quarantine, then we actually went into quarantine, and there were different status. I think we actually started here in Virginia the beginning of April, so about two weeks now. I'll yeah. Quarantine. I think things started to shut down probably for a month now in terms of you know sports leagues and things like that. Every I think it, the the domino started to fall probably about a month ago, and it's been the longest month I think of our lives. There's been a lot of different things going on, but today uh, there's a lot to talk about. Of course, in that time, there's been social distancing is a, is a, a thing now. You know, it's a it's a common phrase that people are using in quarantine. Uh, who thought we'd be here? Um, if you thought about this even six months ago that we would all be quarantined or, or had to practice social distancing and the economy would be completely shut down. I think um, if you told someone that, they would call you a lunatic, yet mm-hmm. here we are. Here we are. Um, and and this, is why, this is why when we talk about these things, some of these things may seem crazy, but um, you don't know what's coming and what's coming down the pipe. And for you and me, it's, it's more important here to communicate uh, the truth of some of these things rather than maybe what's being parroted by the mainstream media and by people who are unfortunately watching it and buying into everything that they say, we wanna offer an alternative view. Um, and, and not just a, an alternative, but what we think is, is a better way in terms of conducting ourselves. So in that realm, we're gonna talk about six ways that quarantine is actually ruining our lives and actually not saving us, but actually making our lives worse. So uh, with that, Andrea, why don't you start? You tell me, um, one of your ways that you feel that uh, this quarantine and the social distancing is actually ruining our lives. Okay, let's start with the Constitution. Let's just go right at it. I can't think of any way we can ruin our lives worse than by violating our first and primary constitutional right. Freedom to assemble, freedom to come together, freedom of speech. Um, anyone who has a theory, for example, if, if you want to associate um, COVID-19 with maybe 5G, radiation, these things are automatically shut down. That's freedom of press right there. Not being able to worship uh, at church. This is all violations of our First Amendment, and we're not ever going to go back to where we were before this. It's just not going to happen. Once once you've been violated or once you've crossed that line, there's, there's very little that we can do to, to go back and to get those rights back. And I think what's frightening here, and I think the reason we're going to call this a better way is once people don't understand um, that all these rabbit holes are connected, whether you enter the rabbit hole of health and wellness, whether you enter the rabbit hole of um, government corruption or deep state, whatever hole you enter in, if you're questioning mainstream uh, pharmaceutical drugs and vaccines, you're going to find out they're all connected at the end. And I think where we lost a lot of people is they're so fearful of what this um, COVID-19 might be, is they surrendered all their rights. And these are people who have stood up for either health and wellness, they've stood up for religious freedom, and they've stood up for their gun rights uh, most recently. And they're all ready to sell out completely because of this pandemic. And I think this is like absolutely frightening and it's ruined our, our lives for, for us and for our posterity. What do you think, Derek? Yeah, I think I think you're right in terms of the precedence that's being set here. Um, it's, it's already been set. I mean, if you look back at uh, you know September 11th, 2001, what what is they they you know they took away certain rights there in terms of travel and, and different things with the with the restrictions that we have now when you're traveling. And has any of that changed? No. Here we are, 19 years later. None of that stuff has been repealed or or even drawn back a little bit. It's, in fact, it's probably only got a little bit worse. So again, as you say, once they start to peel back those rights, you need to be very careful um, because those rights, there's a, if history um, repeats itself, which it has, um, those rights aren't coming back. So it's very, it's a very sketchy time to be giving up um, your, your constitutional rights at this point in time. I think that's a great point. Um, one big one that I want to talk on 
is um, when, you, when you're quarantined, if you're kept in your house more often than, than normally you would be, um, from a health aspect, is that you're going to um, block out uh, any opportunity for you to get your vitamin D or as I call, um, okay. neuroregulatory hormone is actually what it is. It's actually not a vitamin per se. And, um, you know, we've been taught to fear the sun um, over the last few decades. And there's a reason for that. We won't get into that. But we've been <laughs> taught to fear the sun. I mean, you go out, people are slathering on sunscreen before they even step outside. Or you go to the beach or even go to a soccer game like I might go. People are immediately setting up umbrellas so they can block the sun out. And for me, this is what summer is all about, is actually to be able to get some sunshine. Of course, you need to be obviously cautious and don't burn yourself and things like that. But people are, are over-preparing themselves to block out all uh, sun's rays as much as possible. And we know that vitamin D is a neuroregulatory hormone. Um, most people are much happier when the sun is out. Yeah. And um, we also know that it's a great immune booster. I mean, it's, it's a great immune modulator. Um, and it's, it's absolutely required. It helps upgrade our DNA. I mean, think about it for a second. How long would the earth last, Andrea, if the sun was completely blocked out and everything went dark? How long do you think we would last as a human race? I don't know. Do you have an answer? But I, I, don't, don't I, I don't have an answer, but I can tell long. you it wouldn't be very long. It wouldn't be very long. You can't, as soon as you can't grow any food, for example, but even, even other than that, we, I think we've forgotten about how important the sun is. I mean, it's, it's, it's the center of our existence on this planet to be able to survive, grow food, whatever it is we need to do. The sun is at the center of that existence. And, um, and that's not to say, you know, going without the sun for a few days is, is going to be completely detrimental. But it's, again, it's, it's taken away our opportunity to do the things we need to do to help protect ourselves from this so-called virus. And that's to build our immunity. And that's a big one. There's a reason that people don't get sick uh, as often during those summer and those warmer months, uh, because that immunity is there that we don't normally get uh, during the winter, at least for a lot of us in North America. Um, and so blocking out that opportunity to get vitamin D is in fact ruining our lives in many different ways, especially health-wise, and especially even related to um, our own emotions. Um, it, it only, it's, it's more, much more depressing um, when the sun's not around and we're not able to get into it. So for me, that's a big factor that's ruining our lives right now as a result of this quarantine. I totally agree. I, told, I just read an article as well where, you know, we're surrounded by beaches over here in Coast Virginia, and, you know, they're handing out tickets for children who are just playing in the, in the sand. So they want people to move along in the beach. Well, children don't do that. Children are stationary on the beach. That's how they get their sun running back and forth from the water to the, the beach. Um, they're not really big fans of just walking along, you know, for, for a while. So yeah. yeah totally. So what's your what do you have next? So vitamin D, we've got Fear. what constitution, vitamin D, what do you what's next on your list? Fear. Um, mm. what 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 resonates with you when you go out? You know, I'm in my home a lot and then when I go out I'm, I'm just shocked by the level of um, fear that's out there with people they're so fearful they're um, and, and you know that's an emotion that plays on your health and I, I know you know this as a health and wellness advocate and you know when, whenever people are working with um, a functional doctor or trying to heal themselves in a natural way very often um, their healer or their coach will have them go through like emotional healing because so much of that emotional healing in our body is translating into more oxidative stress, more fear, more disease, um, and the disease state in our body. And so I think the common, the common emotion that I'm sensing amongst the people is fear. And, um, and that's a frightening thing. That's a really frightening thing. It's not good for their health and it's not serving them in any way. And also it goes hand in hand with them giving up their, their constitutional rights. And, and the fear comes from lack of understanding uh, what this is. And you and I have talked about this before, like what is a virus? We spoke about germ theory, we spoke about strain theory. I feel like once you understand that, the fear will vanish or it should vanish because once you understand you have control and that we all have control, um, I don't think there's anything to be fearful of. No, I agree. And as, we, as I already said with the vitamin D, the lack of vitamin D, fear is gonna depress your immune system. And um, this fear is also turning people into narcs. I mean, people are calling out, are, are actually yeah. going against other human beings. Like you just said, calling people out that may be out trying to get some fresh air, going for a walk, things like that. They're calling them into the authorities. People don't see the slippery slope that this turns into, what kind of uh, police state this can turn into when you have people that are policing each other and, and calling each other in like that. This, this can be a very scary situation. And we've seen other countries in history do these types of things and it didn't end well. So I agree with you, this, this fearful state, um, it, it drops your immunity. And the other thing it does, 
drops your IQ. You automatically become, to put it bluntly, dumber when you become when you're in fear because there's something with your adrenals and things how you react you do not make rational decisions you actually dumb down your iq when you're in a fearful state which of course as we know that makes you an easier easier controlled um, by the powers that be and this is again not something that we want to be in but of course it suits uh it suits the handlers very well so i got you on the fear for sure so kind of in that realm too the next one for me is is lack of of fresh air um, you know, not being able to get outside. There's, there's a few different things here. Number, um, number one, um, a lot of people don't consider that the level of contaminants, biological, chemical, otherwise, uh, inside a home is usually much higher than it is outdoors. Of course, it depends on the situation. It might depend on where you live, of course, but generally speaking, unless you're living right beside a factory or something like that, you can imagine that the concentration of indoor pollutants inside of a home is gonna be much stronger than it is if you're out in the ocean, for example because obviously the environment has going to have an opportunity to cleanse itself. It's a bigger, you know, it's a bigger space. When you're inside of a home. You've got, you know, we've got carpets, you've got paint, you've got pets, you've got biological contaminants. You might have mold. There could be a number of different things. So usually the concentration of contaminants are higher. This is uh, cause things like sick building syndrome is, is a name that they've given it where people can get sick from being inside, even the ventilation, if it's not that good. Um, so not having that fresh air um, is, is extremely um, detrimental to this person's health. And even to add to that, um, the fact that uh, masks are being so heavily endorsed, one of the biggest things outside the quarantine, right? Um, and um, the social distancing is the mask. That's probably the trifecta, the three biggest things we're hearing about. Well, what's in those masks, Andrea? What kind of chemicals, what kind of things are in those masks when you have those things wrapped around your mouth? And what kind of chemicals are you breathing in, number one? Number two, when you're exhaling, you're exhaling carbon dioxide into the mask. And then you get to inhale that carbon dioxide. We're not meant to inhale carbon dioxide. We're humans. Plants are going to inhale carbon dioxide, return oxygen to us. We inhale oxygen. So again, now you're inhaling that. And plus you reduce the flow. Among other things, if you do have some contaminants, you're creating that moist atmosphere inside the mask where more things could grow. So again, this lack of circulation, this lack of fresh air, ironically, for something that's being labeled as have, causing respiratory problems, the masks are doing the exact wrong thing. And this shouldn't be, a, this is not a surprise to some of us. Um, because th that's the way they've always treated it. You know, the, the pharmaceuticals have always, uh, industry has always treated things in a, in a back asswards kind of way. You know, how do you treat a, a disease? Well, you, you put more synthetic, more toxicities into the body. It absolutely makes no sense. This is the same with this. So this lack of fresh air and in, in using these masks and things like this is also uh, ruining our lives, in my opinion. My third reason of why this quarantine is ruin ruining our lives um, and it's going to affect our children is we are just depleting the microbiome. So for example, I went to Trader Joe's and, and people, this is, this is like a natural um, grocery store we have here. And I was shocked that they had us lined out like 40 people lined up to go into the grocery store and we're all six feet apart. I would say nine tenths were wearing a mask. Um, by the time we got to the cart, each cart was cleaned and sterilized before the next person can take it. And they had two people by the door, one hosing off and spraying, the other wiping with sanitizer and making sure that people were, were properly distanced. And all I could think about was, you know, we talk about grounding, we talk about how important it is to get out there into nature and to, you know, get in some dirt, get, get some good um, bacteria into your body, expose yourself to these things because what happens is a healthy body a healthy immune system, you know this, Eric, it's going to build up powerful antibodies and it's going to make us stronger. We make it down a little bit, but it's going to come back and make us fortified and stronger. And um, there's very interesting studies showing that things like polio came, came out and it was because what should have manifested itself as a flu in, in a child, because that person never got these, these basic sicknesses because they were never exposed to any kind of bacteria whatsoever, uh, came back in a vengeance as polio later. Like it manifested so much stronger because they never built up their antibodies naturally. And it's incredible what the body can do. And um, I always like to go back to, you know, how many viruses exist in, the, in this planet? How many, how much bacteria is on this planet? And, you know, I love that number 10 to the 31. It's millions times all the stars in the sky. Um, that's how many viruses there are. So we cannot, vaccinating against a virus is not the answer hiding from them is not the answer we would all be dead we, we you know 
they're out there and they're not going to attack us. The answer is to build our, our powerful immune system and, and it, will, it will fight these things. And actually, I love the, the concept that there's so many and they're actually there to support the highest form of creation, which is the human being. So all that bacteria, those viruses, the fungi, instead of being our enemy, because they would have killed us right from the start, um, they're actually there to serve us and to help build up our immunity and, and actually become a part of us on, on a very micro level. If germs were actually the killer, we'd all be dead by now, but they're not. And we have learned how to develop immunity by building our microbiome, being exposed to certain things. That's how we create natural immunity. Um, so yeah, I agree with you completely. The microbiome is something that's um, that's been degraded and being further degraded with the amount of sanitization, other things that are going on now, and people just being afraid to to uh, expose themselves to anything um, outside of their little bubble. So one of the biggest and one of the most controversial subjects um, within this, the, the ways that um, this quarantine is ruining our lives, is the is the economy. Um, people are starting to realize this now, and as the days go by and the economy continues to um, be stopped. Um, people are going to realize how much, how important it was to actually maybe handle this a little bit better, um, to allow the economy to still be able to function in some kind of way. Because what happens when you shut down the economy, when you start to, people start to lose jobs and they don't have the money to pay the rent or don't have money to pay the bills or they don't have money to buy groceries. And then they rely on the government in order to give them money, um, in order to be able to do these things. And the government only can do so much. And if the, in a in traditional sense, if the government gives you money, then there's something that's going to come on the backside because they can't take any money that they're not getting from you first. And as we and know, they don't have money, so they're right, exactly. And plus, there are already how many and how many trillion in debt um, in the government already. Think about that from a household perspective. If you're that much in debt, how much further can you go in debt without incurring more um, interest costs, things like that? And there's going to be lots of those types of costs if if we're not careful. And interest might be inflation. Or hyperinflation depending on what happens but the whole point being is that there's gonna be a lot of different things that are gonna happen with this things that again is I think um, it was also mentioned that we can't have it so that the 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 cure is worse um, that you know because that's right now the whole cure was everyone stay home um, yeah. but now that's actually turning into the problem um, because people are unable to go to work unable to feed their families if this continues on you're actually gonna have some more people that are going to um, actually physically starve um, it's a real, real life scenario if this continues to go on for any length of time where people could be committing suicide. This has happened during recessions and depression. This just, this isn't to scare people. This is just actually what has happened. People um, are afraid. People are afraid, right? And this, and this is, this is something that how long can you take this? How long can you, um, sacrifice the economy? I mean, there's, if, if you don't have a government to bail us out, how much longer is it going to be before people have to go back to work in order to earn an income? Because most businesses and most people can't survive, you know, a week or two out of a job um, without having some kind of, um, you know, financial infusion. And if that's the case and you slow everything down, these businesses go out of, you know, they're, they're done. They go out of business. Uh, these people, as a result of that, people don't have jobs because without these businesses, people don't have jobs. And if you're not growing, you know, your own food, which most people aren't, you don't even have some of the basics and that can really ruin a person's life. Start to talk to people who have lost their jobs and how fearful, how scared, you know, how hungry they're starting to become as a result of not having that income on a day to day basis. So the, there, I think there was a better way. Um, and I don't have the perfect way, but there was a better way to handle that, but shutting down the economy completely as we did over something as you and I have discussed as silly as this virus, as it really is compared to things, even like the seasonal flu. Yeah. Um, which in our opinion is no worse than that. Um, and to shut the whole economy down for that, that also sets that dangerous precedents going forward. I mean, how many more things are you going to shut down the economy for? And you, you're not going to be able to shut down the economy multiple times like this. People aren't going to just going to be able to go back to work after four or five weeks of this. Some people aren't going to just walk back onto the job. The economy is not going to just magically recover. The okay. government can't stimulate this without causing other issues after the fact. So we, it's a very fine line. I agree. And uh, certainly you and I know we don't want anyone to die over this needlessly. But we know that there's people that are going to be passing away. They're passing away from pneumonia. There's people that, you know, 20 some thousand a day passing away from cancer, all these other dreaded diseases that no one's talking about. Uh, but yet who's crying for those people right now? Um, unless they're a immediate family member, you're not. The numbers worldwide, and you look at them every day, guys, if you go to world, worldometer.info, you can find them 16.5 million people as of last night. So these numbers are already outdated, have died this year. It, the mm. numbers are incredible and our overworked um, hospital staff on the front lines 
have managed to do 12 million plus abortions since January 1st. Um, nothing's slowing that down. So just, just think about that. And going back to the economy, I just would, I, I, I agree with you so much. And again, this isn't just something that's going to affect us. It's going to affect our posterities, our children and their children. Uh, we totally dropped the ball on this. And it's not something we can just recover from. We all know that if there's an accident on the freeway and you have four lanes of cars all pushing into one lane because of a slowdown, which is affected, which is what we're going through right now. Traffic could go on for hours and hours and hours and everything is basically at a standstill um, because of one car accident. And that's what we're dealing with right now. And I was reading the repercussions if, with just the farming industry. The farmers are throwing out the food because they can't have no way to get it to market. They've got no way. So they have all these things and they, they have reasons why they have to throw it out. Um, they, they can't even give it away because they don't have the infrastructure to do that right now. And then we're also talking, uh, you know, this is a different rabbit hole, but you know, you talk about farming and people aren't doing that. Well, it's really difficult to buy seeds right now. If you go to a store, they're actually telling you that's a non-essential thing to buy and they're not selling seeds and soil to people in mulch. Um, in the meantime, they're killing the farmers. I don't know what this is going to look like for us, um, but I think um, not having food could very well be an issue. I mean, the economy and then just not having food, you know, in six months or a year is a very real, um, very real problem. Yeah, there's a, there's that ripple effect that I, I think um, maybe a lot of people aren't seeing. They're not, not seeing past, a lot of us aren't seeing past our nose in terms of what happens next when you do this type of quarantine and the, the vision and, you know, the ripple effect. What does this look like, you know, six, nine months down the road? And I think a lot of people, it's hard to fathom. Uh, hard to understand what could happen, um, but we're just painting a part of the picture of what could you know, happen. Derek, I'd like to go kind of end with a quote. Um, Stalin, who was a mass murderer, you know, um, dictator, horrible leader um, in the early 1900s, um, he has a famous quote, and he says, the death of one is like a, a tragedy. The death of a million is a statistic, and that's speaking to the psychology of people. If we all just tell the story about Margaret Jones who died from COVID-19 and we go into the story, we show her grieving husband and her children and those affected, the country is going to mourn. It's a psychological thing. We're all going to cry. At the same time, if you say 16 million people have died this year, no one really cares. It becomes a number. Mm -hmm. So I think our media who um, is very manipulative and part of the deep state is, is doing a very good job of making this very emotional, very personal, um, so that we can all comply. Um, because if they were just giving numbers, you know, like these numbers of abortion or how many people have actually died this year or how those numbers really aren't even comparing to the flu and pneumonia that happen every year. And if we look at the numbers and we say, well, what happened to the flu and pneumonia numbers anyway? Because they all dropped off the chart because we're all, everyone's got, being diagnosed with COVID-19. Um, I think that would really change the story. I think it would too, exactly. It's, it's about <clears throat> exact, it's about blowing up numbers um, and creating this emotional distress, this fear um, that's really made this into a pandemic. Um, and for some of us, it may appear to people that, you know, we don't care, um, you know, that we don't care about, you know, the person you just mentioned that they passed away from COVID-19 and actually nothing could be further from the truth. The reason that we're blowing the whistle on this and the reason we're trying to tell the truth around this is that there is much more at stake um, right now outside of even this virus, um, whatever it happens to be. I mean, it's, as weak as it is in terms of what it's actually the issues that it's caused compared to other pandemics. Mm -hmm. um, but not only that, to shut down the entire economy and around the globe for it has way more repercussions than, than just this, the, the virus itself. And, um, and that's where the real, that's one of the, where the real issues are. And you and I are trying to help people understand or maybe even get grasp of how much bigger this is. Mm -hmm. um, and then we do this. I mean, I'm, I'm a health mentor for a reason. I'm a healer for a reason. I'm trying to teach people how to build their immune systems, how to do the best in this world. Because the reality is, you know, we all come to this planet and at some point we're going to leave this planet inside this body. We know that's going to happen. And we try to navigate life as best as possible as we can within those timelines. And there's no guarantee. Uh, for any of us in terms of what's going to happen to us. There's a risk every single day. You drive your car to work. That's a risk, right? Some people are going to drive their car to work and get in a car accident and could die. 
that's a risk that we're all taking on a day-to-day -day basis. It, it, what the question really is, is what point in time do we have to quarantine ourselves and, and save us from all these things? But are they really saving us from anything? Or are they saving us from having better lives um, or, and, and lives without fear? I mean, there's certainly a time in a place um, where we need to take precautions. Um, but I don't feel that this is one of those times. I feel this is really blown completely out of proportion. And we're seeing lots of numbers that are outside of the mainstream media that are being told about hospitals, uh, many of them being actually quite empty. And these are reports on the ground from people who are saying the hospitals are empty. There's actually no one hardly in there. Yeah, there's going to be a few that are overwhelmed. Some of them being diagnosed with COVID-19, even though there's underlying symptoms and core morbidities that are, that are happening that they aren't reporting. And they're just chalking it all up to, so they can have these numbers to keep us in a fearful state for what next? And that's the question. What's next? We've discussed this and we don't need to go down that rabbit hole, but we've already discussed some of these things. What's next uh, for the citizens, the way they've rolled it out now? What's going to happen next? It's going to take away more of your freedoms. It's going to subject you to more um, experiments, let's call them, that could be coming down the pipe. And there's several of them already coming down the pipe. And for those that are, we'll say, awake and are listening to this stuff, they know. They know the things that are potentially are already in the works and are coming down the pipe. For those that don't want to look that way and are choosing to look away, um, maybe ignorance is bliss right now, but in the future, um, it might not be that way when these things are suddenly thrust upon you and that even more freedoms are taken away and you find yourself that you're basically on a prison planet. Mm -hmm. Don't want that to happen. <laughs> no, absolutely not. We're free people. That's what we're meant to be. We're meant to be free, uh, mobile, move around. Again, there's always circumstances, but that's what we're meant to be, um, not locked up in our homes. Um, we're meant to roam about the planet, enjoy ourselves, enjoy nature outside, you know, food and be able to have, you know, work and make a living, all those things. But all those things right now um, have been in the toilet for you know, approximately three to four weeks. And uh, if it continues on, I can, um, I can guess that if this happens for four more weeks, people will be starting to talk about jobs and the economy again, because people will literally be starving and they'll be trying to feed their families and they'll be trying to go back to work um, when they find out the government can't bail them out and that this is actually a way worse situation than, um, what the whole projection was around COVID-19. Exactly, exactly. I think that's a great way, great place to end it, Derek. So I want to thank you again, Andrea, for uh, coming on here with me and uh, exploring these some, somewhat, let's say, controversial topics. Um, but as we know, we're not here to be controversial. That's not actually our goal at all. We're just here to tell the truth and help enlighten people a little bit, make them even think about um, think about things that they never thought about before and make some of your own conclusions based on some of the things we're talking. Do some of your own research. I start to think about some of the other things that are going on out there um, because we truly care about people living healthy and happy lives. And that's why we're looking for a better way. And that's why uh, we do these lives to help you guys out. So hopefully this was helpful to you. So again, Andrea, thank you very much for uh, taking the time to have this chat with me this evening. And uh, we'll do this again. Always a pleasure, Derek. Have a great night. Awesome. Thank you.